Uh, Madam Chair. The Senator from Rhode Island. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, Kathy Hutchinson last spring picked up a cup of coffee and took a sip. Now, why have I come to the floor of the United States Senate to talk about Kathy Hutchinson last spring picking up a cup of coffee and taking a sip? Because 15 years earlier, Kathy Hutchinson was working in her garden when she suffered a stroke that left her paralyzed. Kathy didn't just lose the ability to use her arms and legs, she also lost the ability to speak. I'm sorry to say that this condition is not unique to Kathy. It happens regularly enough that there's a medical term for it, locked-in syndrome. And that's how Kathy lived for nearly 15 years, alert and mentally sharp, but unable to move or speak, a prisoner in her own body. All of this changed last spring when for the first time in nearly 15 years, Kathy picked up that cup of coffee and took a sip. Kathy Hutchinson is a patient enrolled in a clinical trial at Brown University in Providence, Rhode Island. They're testing a neural interface device known as BrainGate. BrainGate works by placing a small sensor on the brain. The sensor is connected to a computer that interprets the brain's signals to control a specially designed robotic arm. The university researchers asked Kathy to imagine that she was moving her arm in different directions. Then they monitored which neurons fired for those corresponding movements, all in her imagination. Using this brainwave information, researchers attached a robotic arm to the computer. The computer translated the electrical impulses detected by the sensors in Kathy's brain back into commands to tell the arm what to do. Kathy communicates through a device that allows her to type using the movement of her eyes. And she typed that she was ecstatic about the new technology and hopes it can be expanded to one day allow her to walk again. The BrainGate team is also working to determine if this technology can ultimately be used to help individuals paralyzed by stroke or injury to regain greater independence. BrainGate is an example of what is possible when the best minds in science and engineering come together for the common good. Researchers from Brown University, the Department of Veterans Affairs, Massachusetts General Hospital, and the German Aerospace Center collaborated on this project. Their efforts were supported by a grant from the National Institutes of Health, as well as funding from the Veterans Administration and several private foundations. BrainGate is just one of the most recent in a long list of medical breakthroughs that are made possible by our National Institutes of Health. The NIH is the cornerstone of our national commitment to medical research for the benefit of humanity. Research supported by the NIH has led to medical advances that have saved and improved countless lives while making America the world leader in discovery and innovation. More than 80 Nobel Prizes have been awarded for research supported by the National Institutes of Health. In Rhode Island, Brown University has received NIH grants to support cutting-edge research on a multitude of diseases, including cancer, dementia, and muscular dystrophy. In fact, the scope of projects at Brown that receive NIH support is so diverse that the university describes its NIH-backed research as covering everything from autism to Alzheimer's. And yet, 
there are those in Congress who have suggested cutting the NIH's budget. Let's be clear about what cutting the NIH's budget means. It means cutting off funding for research that has provided Kathy Hutchinson her first taste of physical independence in 15 years. It means telling the millions of Americans suffering from cancer that they have to wait longer for life-saving research. And it means suffocating a vibrant American area of innovation and job creation. Cutting the NIH budget has ripple effects far beyond just one federal agency. Quite simply, it will hurt job growth. Medical research is one of the fastest growing fields nationwide. In Rhode Island and across the country, cities are undergoing a renaissance sparked by the growth of high paying careers in medical research. I've heard friends on the other side of the aisle here talk at length about how we need to do more to create jobs. Well, I could not agree more. Now is no time to put jobs at risk by cutting back on the research funding that makes them possible. I know that the Appropriations Committee recently reported a bill to the floor that would increase the NIH budget by $100 million for the coming fiscal year. I applaud my colleagues on the Appropriations Committee for their commitment to this vital agency, and I hope that we will soon be able to vote on their measure. But there is something looming on the horizon that will render this $100 million increase all but meaningless. I'm talking, of course, about sequestration, under which it is estimated that the NIH will face not a $100 million increase, but a $2.4 billion cut. I know a lot of my colleagues have discussed the effect that the sequester will have on defense spending, but it's important to remember that 50 cents out of every dollar of cuts that will occur under sequestration will come out of non-defense spending, including specifically the NIH. Devastating is the word that keeps being used when people are asked how sequestration would affect our National Institutes of Health. That's how NIH Director Dr. Francis Collins described the effect of a nearly 8% cut to the agency's budget. Those who are familiar with science know how important it is in ongoing experiments that there be a consistent data set through the period of the research. When you interrupt research for financial reasons, you can damage the value of research conducted in other years. I agree with my colleagues that we must reduce our long-term deficit. But when we cut funding that creates jobs and leads to life-saving medical breakthroughs, we are pursuing policies that are the epitome of penny-wise but pound-foolish. I hope that we in the Senate can work together to find sensible solutions that reduce the deficit while maintaining our long-standing commitment to medical research and innovation. We owe that much to Kathy and to the millions of Americans whose futures will be brighter thanks to the research and jobs made possible by our American National Institutes of Health. When Kathy Hutchinson interacts with the BrainGate program, it is hard not to get the sense that you're looking into the future, a future where people like Kathy will know that disease or injury will not transform their bodies into a prison. It was Arthur C. Clarke who said that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. For Kathy, for the BrainGate research team, and indeed for anyone who may one day benefit from this remarkable technology, that sip of coffee last spring taken by Kathy Hutchinson was a moment of magic. Let us commit ourselves to providing Kathy, the BrainGate team, and all of those who are relying on us in this body to provide the support they need to keep making magical moments like this possible. With that, Madam President, I yield the floor.